welcome everyone to this presentation, Who Maintains Audit Standards? I'm Mike Richmond, your host for Exemplar Global's Excellence in Auditing Expo 2024. Today's session here at the Expo is presented by Paul Simpson. Paul is the director of S282S Limited, which provides consultancy support for business improvement and recognition, including accreditation and certification to ISO standards. Paul is the former chair of ISO TC 176 SC2, which is the committee with responsibility for ISO 9001. As such, he's really the perfect person to present this session regarding how auditors rely on standards uh, and write, and uh, who writes those standards and how, uh, and the influences that auditors have on that process. So with that, Paul, thanks for joining us here at the Expo. Thank you very much, Mike, and thanks for the introduction. Um, and welcome everybody to the, the presentation. Uh, I say we'll be looking at the, the general topic of who maintains audit standards. Uh, it will cover sort of two main areas. The one is a little bit about the standard development process that uh, uh, some of you may be aware of and some of you may know something of, and I'll hopefully shine a little bit of a light on, on that. And we'll talk about some of the main standards that relate to auditing. Uh, and then the second part, which will be really building on some of the requirements that we'll go through uh, as we cover ISO 19011 and ISO IEC 17021 uh, part one, uh, and what it actually means for us as, as auditors. Um, so without further ado, I'll just sort of run into the, the first section, which explains a little bit about the, the presentation uh, that we're going to go through. Uh, yeah, a little bit about me. So thanks again for Mike for the introduction. Yeah, my background is a quality professional. So all my working life in quality. I have then branched out into other areas, so including environmental and health and safety uh, management and a couple of other areas, but I won't go into those in too much detail. Uh, and the important thing is I've audited to all of the standards that I've been working with. So I've audited in a range of different disciplines and applied some of the, uh, the requirements from the conformity assessment standards and some of the best practice that's covered in 19011 in auditing uh, organizations to those standards and also I've been involved as an internal auditor so first party uh, second party so working with suppliers uh, and also uh, third party so covering uh, the certification schemes and the conformity assessment to ISO 9001, ISO 14001 and ISO 45000. So I think that qualifies me as a conformity assessment specialist, but I'll leave that to you to decide. And the other point which which Mike has uh, touched on, uh, I am involved in the standards development route. So uh, a couple of the standards that we'll be looking at today, uh, I have had a, a sort of first, first hand experience with development. And as Mike said, although I no longer chair ISO TC176 subcommittee two, which is, as we said, the subcommittee that has responsibility for ISO 9001, among other standards. Um, I am still involved with SC2 and TC176 as a whole. So in terms of the areas that we'll be covering uh, in the next half an hour, uh, we'll be looking at the audit standards, a little bit about the history of development of the, the standards you can see listed above. Um, 19011 is the guidance standard, which is for auditors of all management system disciplines these days. Uh, 17021 is specifically focused on conformity assessment bodies. So the certification bodies that operate to certify organizations to ISO 9001, 14001, 45001, etc. And the, the third standard that's listed there is 17021-3, which is uh, competence requirements for auditors of quality management systems. So there is a separate uh, added on standard for the 17021 series, which looks specifically as saying, well, what does a good or a competent quality management system auditor look like? And again, we'll talk about some of the, the areas within that standard and what it means for us. But there are others, and we'll briefly look at the other areas of standardization and requirements that apply to the work that we do. 
Uh, and in principle, one of the things that we're looking at across the whole piece of auditing standards is this requirement to be competent. And we'll talk about some of that. And then right at the end of the, the session, I'll be going into the what's next. So hopefully this will be the session or the section of the session where you get your takeaway. So what do I need to do now to demonstrate that competence uh, to improve some of the skills that I have uh, and to ensure that I demonstrate those correct behaviors, which we're, uh, we're going to look at as we go through. So firstly, uh, 1911, uh, you can see at the end of this slide, we've got a little bit of the history of the auditing standards within ISO. Um, so there is a, a standard that predates the ISO standard in 1990. So there was a, a British standard, BS 7229, which was guidelines for auditing quality management systems. Um, but it's worth understanding that these standards rose because of the growth of uh, assessment and certification to ISO 9001. So uh, here in the UK, it was driven a lot by the UK government who were pushing quality standards and quality certification out to the UK manufacturing base. So they saw as drivers for this, the need for uh, the UK to improve its product quality and they saw one of the ways of doing that was uh, quality management standards. And then they also saw beyond that to say, well, if we're going to have those standards, we may ask organizations to be certified to those standards to be able to demonstrate they meet those standards. And to do that, we need auditors. Uh, so they set up a framework for uh, BSI as the UK national standards bodies to produce guidance for what good audits look like and then for uh, the industry itself to be regulated by having assessors which was the term used at the time uh, certificated to be able to audit to ISO 9001. So jumping to the second bullet, apologies, I've started at the end of the slide, but I'm happy to, to sort of pick up on the others as we go. Um, the latest edition is 2018. Um, I had some brief involvement with the 2018 edition. I had more involvement with the, uh, the 2011 edition. Um, there is, and in my inbox today, there is a, a, a resolution that says PC302, which is the ISO project committee uh, that will be uh, developing the next edition of uh, ISO 19011 has been reformed. And the decision is that 19 will be revised. So that is hot off the press. Um, and again, I won't go through this line by line. In the third bullet, we talk about what is the purpose of 19011. So it gives some suggestions as to the area. So again, focusing on quality management, environmental management, but it talks about the, the need and the guidance that's provided in 19011 for principles of auditing, managing audit programs. So somebody back at, at the center needs to ensure that we have a program to audit organizations that is suitable for the needs. Uh, and then the actual conduct of the audits. So that is 19011, and we'll go through some of the requirements in a little bit more detail. Separately, the ISO IEC 17021 document goes into a lot more detail about how the certification body itself should operate. And again, we'll cover that uh, in a short while. So just in summary, 19011, principles of audit and again if this was a, a live webinar i'd be asking for some hands and some uh, shout them out as to what are the main principles of auditing um as this isn't a live webinar as it's a recorded session we will have a slide and i'll run through some of those uh, in the next slide and then it talks about the actual process of auditing and if you look down those four sub bullets, plan, conduct, report, and follow up, you will see 
a hopefully a fairly familiar cycle. So it's not quite plan, do, check, act, but it's not far off. And the logic of why it's not quite plan, do, check, act is the audit itself is a check. So instead of plan, do, check, act, we have plan, where we set objectives, we define the scope of the audit, we identify what the criteria are that we're going to audit against. And again, most of that will be centered around ISO 9001 if it's a quality management system audit or ISO 14001 for environmental management systems. But it includes other elements. And when we look at the knowledge and skills of auditors, again a little bit later on, we will see that there are other criteria that we should bring with us when we go to audit the organizations, whether it's as a second party or a third party, or even as an internal auditor. And again, I'll come back to those. Uh, conduct of the audit. So initiating the audit is really setting it up, getting in touch with the, the person that we're going to audit, whether that's a, a company, an organization, or a, a department, or a process. Um, taking necessary samples. Now, again, for a, an ISO standard, it can't be specific. It can't say we need three of everything. But what it can do is it says your sampling has to be representative. So if you're dealing with an organization that's maybe handling uh, a thousand web orders an hour, you've got to take a representative sample of those orders as they come through. If you're dealing with more project basis, you're going to be sampling within the single project that, that's ongoing. The audit itself. So how do we go about gathering evidence of conformance with requirements or non-conformance requirements? And it talks about interviewing and again, uh, following an audit trail. It doesn't use those particular terms, but it, it talks about the audit trail uh, until we've got satisfactory evidence that a requirement is met. Uh, and it also then talks about the uh, the auditor's role in ensuring that they get the best out of out of the auditee. So as we're interviewing, we're considering the individuals that we're talking to, we're considering the data that's presented to us, we're considering the process that's in front of us, and we are making sure that the audit itself is, is valid. The next area, communications. So as auditors, we have a primary role which is to communicate the results of our auditor our, our audit even so as we go through we should be keeping auditees up to date with how the audit is going so if i leave an area the person i've been auditing should know before i go whether any non-conformities or observations have been identified and similarly at the end of the audit i have to present my findings uh, and this is where the auditor earns their their money in some ways. They have to give that accurate picture of the organization and they have to communicate it at a closing meeting and in a final report. Judgment. So as we go through an audit, we audit against a requirement and we gather evidence. And if the evidence matches the requirement, we have conformity. If there is a clear gap, we have a non-conformity. And if it's not quite certain, we have some more work to do to establish whether the conformity exists or not. And again, in 1911, it talks about that judgment. And we've sort of touched on it already, but non-conformities, observations, statements of conformity, these are all findings that we communicate back to the organization. Uh, and the findings themselves are a vital part of the audit results, whether it is non-conformity or conformity. Uh, again, as we've gone through the audit process, we have been communicating with the organization, but at the end of that audit, we do have to communicate those results back uh, verbally and in a, a written uh, audit report. And then the final area with 
19.011 is to talk about um, closing audit findings. So again, as the organization uh, investigates the findings that we've raised, they will come back to us with some proposed corrective actions and actions to prevent recurrence. Uh, and as the people with boots on the ground, we're the best judges to say, has that corrective action addressed the finding that I raised? So if I raise the nonconformity, is that corrective action suitable? Can I close it out? Have they um, put in place actions that would prevent that nonconformity from recurring in the future? Okay. And then the final area within 19011 that they talk about is behaviours. And this is some of the uh, sort of interpersonal skills and some of the value values that we take in as individuals into the audit process uh, and are vital to an effective audit uh, completion. And again, we'll see some of those in a, in a second. So those principles. Now, again, I'm not going to go through the, the full list. It's, uh, um, it is something that's readily available Part of the recommendations at the end as you get familiar with 19011 and investigate some of the other resources that are available. But what I will do is pick out on a couple and they're all pretty much at the top of that, that list. So um, integrity. As auditors, our prime duty is to, to be honest about what we see. Um, one of the things I always say when I'm training auditors is our role is to hold up a mirror to the organization. That's what you look like. And we can only do that if we're honest. If we go into an organization and we're raising a whole raft of non-conformities and they're going, that's not us. We are well managed. We satisfy our customers. They keep coming back. Uh, then that's not an honest picture. And conversely, so I have had auditors come into my organizations and I'm dealing with the problems. I'm fighting fires. I'm keeping plates spinning. And they go away with no nonconformities, no, no observations. That doesn't help me. Doesn't help me as an organization. Doesn't help me as a quality manager. So, um, yeah, honesty is vital. Similarly, fair presentation, which leads to that honest opinion. If that's what I see, that is what I report. I don't duck a nonconformity and I don't fabricate requirements that don't exist. So fair presentation is vital. And due professional care. I am going to take my samples. I am going to talk to people. Again, sometimes in my auditor training, I talk about what I call the boardroom audits. So where an auditor has their opening meeting in the boardroom with the senior management team around and they never leave the boardroom until they have the closing meeting and then they're off back in their car and on the road. That is not due professional care. You need to be out there where the action occurs, taking your samples, speaking to the people that do the work and not just talking to the quality manager or the environmental manager. And the others, I think I'll, I'll leave there. They're relatively self-explanatory. I'll just briefly mention the final bullet there, risk-based approach. So introduced in 2018, all of the other six principles existed before that. Uh, but one of the changes in 2018 was to introduce this idea of a risk-based approach, uh, approach to auditing. So sampling some of the higher risk areas, making sure that we cover off areas that are potentially going to affect customers or the environmental performance of the organization okay and these audited behaviors again some of them reflect some of those principles of audit so again ethical honest a uh, couple of others that are more about our style as auditors so again open-minded you need that to get to fair presentation Diplomatic, again, that may not necessarily uh, affect the end result of the audit, but if you're not diplomatic, it could. So you're going to get less response if you're if you're seen to be overbearing, not allowing people to have their say. 
Okay. Again, all of these, I think, I hope for the audience for exemplar expo presentations should be self-evident. But again, they are covered in more detail in ISO 19011. And then the area where 19011 says we should have knowledge and skills. And as we all should know, knowledge and skills equals competence. So to be a competent auditor, I should have generic knowledge and skills. And what that is, is I should know about audit. So what is the principle of audit? What's the, the process that we go through with audit? Um, what are the risks associated with audit? If I'm auditing, I can introduce risks to the organization that I'm auditing. There could be risks of my audit not getting an honest picture of the organization. Bullet two, discipline and sector specific. Now, I'm going to introduce to you a TC176 group that is running at the moment. It's uh, TC176 task group two, uh, and that group is entitled the Brand Integrity Group. Now, TC176 has been concerned with audits to its flagship standard ISO 9001 for a number of years. Uh, and back in 2014, there was moves to establish uh, within TC176 that is looking to influence that audit to uh, ISO 9001. So working in a number of different areas to try and improve, to raise the bar of QMS auditing. And one of the concerns is we feel that a number of auditors out there do not understand ISO 9001 well enough. So they're not quality professionals. They're not familiar with the requirements of 9001. They don't understand the ISO 9000 quality management principles uh, that are freely available to download. Um, and similarly, sector specific. So my background is sort of engineering, uh, consulting, oil and gas, um, automotive. So I've worked in all of those areas and I would feel confident in going into organizations in those areas to be able to um, establish that they're satisfying quality requirements. But I wouldn't go to a lawyer's. I wouldn't go to a health care setting because I am not competent. I do not have that sector specific competence. And again, one of the things that I'll cover in the takeaway is we should know the areas that we're competent in and we should stick to our knitting stick to the areas that we know well there's a second section there knowledge skills for auditing multiple disciplines so if we're asked to do an integrated audit how do we make sure that we're covering the the ground effectively how do we make sure that we're auditing and covering each of the standards that we're uh, are in the portfolio to the extent necessary for the organization that we're auditing and then two further sections so achieving auditor competence and this talks about getting the training the lead auditor training course that um, establishes that we have the necessary underpinning knowledge of audit and of uh, the uh, identification of non-conformities in a case study we can do that we can we have the skills to present in a in a closing meeting, for example. Uh, we also then have experience in those sectors that I've mentioned to be able to recognize good from not quite so good. And we maintain that and we're approved, signed off to do those audits. So all of this is included in 1911. And then it goes on to say, I say quite a bit later in section seven, we need to maintain and improve auditor competence because we all know sectors do not stand still. Quality management standards don't stand still. ISO 9001 is being revised as we speak. ISO 14001 has been confirmed, but ISO 45001 is being revised. So all of these will need us to update our knowledge on the new requirements that come to those key management system standards. Okay. So that's a quick overview of, of 19011. Uh, as I mentioned, the PC302 has been re-established. 
the uh, chair or the convener role within PC302 is held by ANSI. Um, it's actually a joint working group or a joint development group with ISO Casco, which I'm going to come on to shortly. Uh, and if you are interested, get in touch with your local national standards body and you may get involved in um, any changes, new requirements that go into ISO 19011. Okay, I'm going to move on to ISO IEC 17021-1-2015, bit of a mouthful. Uh, conformity assessment standard, uh, the link in the slides, which you'll get after the, the session, takes you to the, uh, the page on ISO's website. Uh, it's produced by ISO CASCO. ISO CASCO is a, an unusual area of ISO. It's a, a standalone committee so it's conformity assessment standards committee specifically looking at areas that relate to conformity assessment and the, the current chair is from kenya bureau of standards and again it's quite unusual within iso in as much as the iso holds the secretariat which just shows the importance that they um, attach to conformity assessment much in the same way as I mentioned with the brand integrity, there's a lot of work to make sure that the conformity assessment industry is following the requirements that are in all the ISO management system standards. So 17021-1 applies to conformity assessment bodies known as CABs or CBs sometimes. Uh, and 17021-1 defines how certification bodies should operate and how they should assess and certify organizations to ISO 9001, ISO 14001, ISO 45000. And it's about some of the structural requirements of the CB. So the area that I've just sort of highlighted in here is, sorry, get the laser pointer running, impartiality. So when we look at 19011 it talks about auditors being independent 17021-1 takes it another stage it says you have to be and you have to be shown to be impartial so what does that mean it means as a conformity assessment body i am going to assess your management system without fear or favor so if you come to me with a a, a need for certification i have no bias in this i will take your inquiry i will take it through a, a stage of assessment and if the results show that you have an effective quality management system for example i will issue you with a certificate but it then goes on to say there are risks to impartiality and again if this was a, a live session I, I i could ask you to identify some of those risks you can have a think about them while I'm uh, just sort of moving on to the, the the next section. In fact, I'll do that and then I'll come back to those. It then outlines the whole of the process from inquiry through to certification, including the audit process. So although it's covered in 19011, 17021 says, if you're doing this as part of your business, these are things that you must do. So guidance in 19011 requirements in 17021-1 and they also spend some time looking at certification decisions because again as part of that impartiality when we've done all of our work we have to do a, a bit of a pass fail decision here certificate or no certificate and what they're saying within 17021-1 is take into account what the auditors have all said but as a certification body, you now look at that independently and look at the whole of the process from inquiry through to uh, this point when we're going to take a decision on certification. Have we done a good job? Have our auditors done a good job? Has the team that we sent in got the necessary competence to do that work? That sounds a bit late, but that is part of the certification decision. Have we sent the right team in and have they done a good job? okay and then i will still come back to the impartiality 
please you know rely on that the other points i was going to highlight in 17021-1 they also talk about competence but these are requirements so 19011 good guidance 17021 requirements and they're covered in a number of areas one is just in general under section 71 and then annex a which we'll see in a second there are a series of requirements that relate to audit competence and it also talks about the certification body having processes in place to select and ongoing evaluate its auditors so it's not a one-off activity but you've got to decide that auditors are suitable and then you've got to monitor their performance over time to see that they are showing that they are still competent and capable okay so back to the the question that i i sort of left with you a little while ago and uh, i'll be interesting uh or it will be interesting to see if you've got any uh different insights into impartiality impartiality can be influenced by a number of different areas so financial if i've paid you my ten thousand dollars whatever it is does that then place an obligation on me as a certification body to issue you with a certificate and the answer should be no you've paid the money that covers the cert the uh, certification audit costs but the decision is independent similarly have i got any other areas where i am involved with your organization so for example a lot of the cabs have training organizations is there enough separation between the training and the certification auditors because if they are the same then there's a risk to impartiality as an auditor i'm not going to go in and say your internal audit process is is no good if the likely response is going to be but you trained us in it um so these are some of the areas of impartiality that need to be taken into consideration and there are others so there um again no names but i have been audited by a third party certification body and on the one hand they're evaluating my quality management system and on the other hand they're trying to sell me other services that will support my quality management system in this case auditing in my supply chain now that to me is an unacceptable risk to impartiality again interested in any views there's an email in the the last section which you might like to um to avail yourself of okay and these are the uh, requirements in annex a that i mentioned uh a little bit busier than 19011 not really surprising again i'm not going to go through them all but you've you've got them available to uh, review in your own time uh, they are all sort of generally in the public domain now uh, but there are some similarities with 1911 um business management practices you know how businesses operate you know and again that's gained through experience of working in business um this is a similar one to the generic uh, competence that was in 1911 so what an audit is the principles of audit how audits uh, are actually carried out um discipline specific in 1911 specific management system standard so if i'm auditing to 9001 i should know enough about 9001 to audit to it uh this isn't in 1911 but i have to understand my cb's processes and so on uh, and then again i'll just pick a couple of these which are slightly more uh, unusual language skills so i have to be able to communicate i've done audits in um, um other countries and i've an independent translator so that sort of equates to language skills i, I have that capacity through a, um, a support function and then just some of the abilities so i can take notes i can present reports um i can 
carry out interviews suitably. All of these are competences as far as 17021-1 is concerned. Okay, so this is the sort of tail end of what does this mean for us? Um, we should be aware of 19011. Um, I would hope that every every auditor on this call has their own copy. You don't have to, you know, keep it by your bedside table. You don't have to read a paragraph before you go to sleep every night, but you should be familiar with it. And you should have a good understanding of what good practice is, which is 19011. 17021-1, the requirements for competence plus the additional impartiality requirements we should be aware of. If we are working as a third party certification body, it should be covered by their CB processes. Um, 17021-3, they expand those requirements and they say, if I am a quality management system auditor, these are the discipline specific knowledge and skills that I need to have. So again, if you are auditing two as a third party auditor, because this is where it's aimed, I should have a good understanding of what those requirements are. And I should test myself to say, do I really have that? Um, Again, I've seen many auditors and I, I've sort of swapped on LinkedIn and similar bulletin boards uh, discussions about competence. And they tell me, you know, I'm multidiscipline, you know, three standards. And I'm also automotive and I'm also aerospace. And I'm also really how do you maintain your competence with all those areas? I certainly wouldn't have time in my day to be able to do it. And again, I'll come back to the other in a second. These are the questions that I'm going to leave with you. How much do we know about those? And how much are we familiar with them? Do we really have that ability? Uh, and are we demonstrating that um, due professional care? And are we definitely showing fair presentation? Because if we're not, we need to look at our behaviours and look at our assessment processes uh, and, and maybe make some change. And again, I, I used the example earlier of holding the mirror up to the organisation. But yeah, we, we need to be sure that we are impartial. I'm not just leaving a non-conformity because I, yeah, I can't be bothered to follow the audit trail and get to the evidence. No, I've got to be confident that there is a evidence there of a non-conformity before I raise one. And similarly, I'm not soft grading. Well, it is a non-conformity against the requirements, but I'm just going to call it an observation because you'll deal with it anyway. No, that's not a fair presentation. And again, responsibilities. Ultimately, certification bodies, our organisations, if we're doing supplier audits and our audit programme managers, if we're internal auditors, rely on us to do a good job of auditing. So it's down to us to work in our area of, comp of competence, follow due process, exercise due care, and produce an effective report. So if we do all of that, then we're satisfying, you know, the good practice of 19011 as well as any uh, procedures, processes that we're working to. And these are, again, just some of the areas that um, we can get involved in. So how do we keep up to date with technical requirements? Uh, if we're working within automotive or, or aerospace or medical devices, what other sector standards, other documents that are used within the sector that we should be aware of? Are there any as aspects of a, a CB process that we need to, uh, again, be aware of? Um, APG documents. So again, in, in the notes that I send out, you'll have a link to these, but ISO and IAF have a joint auditing practices group, and they have a, a series of guidance documents for auditors who are auditing to primarily 9001. They're, they're starting to branch out into 14001 as well. 
uh, but they talk about you know risk based thinking and they talk about the the process approach uh, and they give good guidance so again we should all be familiar with those again you know do we get involved in in standards making it's one way of sort of keeping skill levels up to the up to the top and you know there are opportunities there and then the final point here uh self-evaluation so how critical are we of our process as auditors you know do we look back over reports and say i think i ducked out there yeah i didn't do a great job there i i can certainly remember in my past career of areas where i came away i think it was okay but it, it could be better and i think that's a powerful um takeaway that you can learn from and, and take forward and similarly with ncr so again am i soft grading am i raising ncrs where there isn't a requirement yeah so again just be aware and, and periodically check just to see that you're uh, meeting requirements okay so final one yeah any questions i think i'm gonna ask mike to sort of chip in as the the representative of the expo 2024 audience with with any questions from what we've covered otherwise again please use the email address if you've got any comments or uh, just fire them through or if you can find me on something like linkedin again i'm always happy to connect Absolutely. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah. And I encourage uh, you see Paul's email there. You can also write us at info at exemplarglobal.org. Uh, if you have questions uh, for, for us or for Paul, uh, feel free to send those through. Um, excellent job, Paul, on that presentation. Really good deep dive into the into the the nitty gritty of, of the standard uh, standards as it applies to, to uh, auditors. Um I want to ask you a question. I did have one that kind of came up as I was uh, listening to you, and I jotted it down. So, um, you know, you're an auditor, uh, yep. as you mentioned. You're, you're you've been involved in standards development as well. So, for those of us that are watching uh, out there, uh, listening to your your presentation today, um, wh what can they do to get involved? Maybe you can expand on that a little bit. I mean, auditors. You know, you and I have discussed this offline. Auditors have some really unique skills that. Um, you know, are, 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 are a value to, to, to forming standards, not only standards that are directly applicable to uh, auditing best practices uh, and auditor competency, but also the broader standards, ISO 9001 as an example. I mean, you know, the, the, the auditors see the way users uh, use these standards or struggle uh, with standards. So what, how can auditors get involved? Yeah, I mean, as I say, I would encourage auditors uh, listening to this and viewing this um, presentation to to get involved and there are a number of ways i will sort of put some links into the notes that i'll forward to you mike and that you can forward then to anybody who's who's attending mm -hmm. um but uh all of the technical committees that i'm aware of who publish management system standards have liaison with auditor bodies and bodies involved with certification and accreditation so a couple of the names that i've uh, used through the course of the, the last sort of 40 minutes um the iaf which is the international accreditation forum they represent the accreditation bodies they have uh, members who are um representing the the certification bodies they have a liaison with tc176 and um, they are also heavily involved in casco so producing the 17021 standards but um technical committees like tc176 want the views of auditors um they will survey at the beginning of any revision year to, to everybody who's interested and i again will encourage that to go through exemplar to all of your certified auditors to say what do you like about 9001 and what do you find difficult when you're auditing to 9001 but what would be better and this is coming back to the point that you and i um discussed and I'll, I'll highlight here is we would like the voice of the auditors in the room so uh, there are a number of members of tc176 from various national standards bodies who are auditors so they can bring that that voice 
But if you had it direct from Exemplar to say, we represent the thousands of auditors wor worldwide who are certified with us, and we think that would have a lot of weight. And you could be uh, a liaison organization to TC176, to uh, ISO CASCO, um, and also you probably have representation on IAF technical committees with um, involved with management system standards. Um, even as individuals, you can have an involvement with the work of, again, I'll stick with TC176 because it's the one I'm most familiar with, through the national standards body so again i'm based in the uk as you can see from the the title under uh, my picture um in the uk mirror we have a number of representations from groups including certification bodies accreditation bodies and also the uk um cqi urca so it's uh the national body who could have representation for for uk similarly for our involvement through um new zealand australia and us national mirror committees but individuals can also apply so you know if you really got uh, an interest in any one of the uh, management system standards you can approach your national standards body and say look i'm really interested in again my example 9001 uh, i'd like to get involved and they yeah. will probably welcome you on board and many many in our audience and i've, I've actually spoken to many of you who, who are probably watching right now um and we've talked about ways uh, among our user group of giving back you know we always talk about ways to, to give back if you've been successful in this career many uh, of course all of you have been and um there's a desire to to give back to to support uh the industry and and you know, use your experiences in a way that can contribute to the ongoing success of of, of standards and schemes, and that's that's one good way of doing it. So I, I think that's an Absolutely, excellent yeah. excellent point. Excellent point, yeah. Paul. Well, Paul, that was a great job. Really, really good session there. Uh, again, we do we do welcome all questions to there. Uh, eat Paul's email directly or uh, write us at info at exemplarglobal.org and we'll get our question, your questions over to Paul. Um, Paul, thank you for doing that. That was a really great session. We appreciate your time today. My pleasure. Thank you very much for the invitation, Mike. Of course, of course. And all of you who have watched us, of course, you're qualified for, for CPD for your, to prove your continuing commitment to education and learning in your, in your career. Just check out the links that are right here on the page and find out ways that you can get your CPD for this session. And you can qualify for CPD on all of our sessions here at the Expo. So, so check all those out. Uh, and check out our other sessions. We have a, a, a dozen sessions for you here at the Expo this year. So hopefully you, you watch them all. So thanks again for being here today. Uh, we'll see you at the next session at Exemplar Global's Excellence in Auditing Expo 2024. So long.